Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. We have a fantastic show for you this evening. JJ Friggy, president of Hartzell Propeller, is here. We're going to talk about so many wonderful things with this amazing company and hopefully teach you quite a bit about your propeller and what it means to you and maybe your next one as well during tonight's show. Before we get started, just a few things. Fall flying is absolutely booming inside of Social Flight. We have tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations, cool things to do, and also our Destination Digest. We've added thousands of destinations that you can fly to all around the country and the world, and all you need to do is go to socialflight.com and just look for them. They they have ratings and reviews and photos. They have like indications as to whether a courtesy car is available there. Pretty much everything you can imagine. You can add your own favorite destination. And we also give, uh, send out our Destinations Digest email with a sampling of things that are in your area. Some are local, some are a little farther, maybe 500, up to 500 miles away. And then a few really aspirational, wonderful ones on a national level. And so be sure to check all of that that out on socialflight.com and in addition to that uh, we also have our fly to win challenge and in our fly to win challenge you just get the social flight mobile app get out there and fly it gives you points even for your home airport you just check in once and you've got points to win we just gave away a lightspeed delta zulu headset our winner was ryan leeward of lewisville texas he flies a 1947 stinson 108 he won that headset now we're giving away another one and so again, all you need to do, get the app, get out there. Even if you check in once you're entered, if you fly many times and get on our leaderboard, you can get additional entries to win. And also as we approach the end of the year, we've got courses on our FA Learning Center with wings credits. If you're an AMP, with an, uh, you can compete uh, or be part of our Aviation Maintenance Technician Awards Program where you uh, take courses towards that. Or if you're an AMP with an inspection authorization, you can uh, get your eight hours of recurrent training directly for, through Social Flight, all for free on your own time. Tonight's broadcast is brought to us by Whipair and their amazing new Yukon propeller made by Hartzell that makes caravans on floats literally leap out of the water. It is really, really amazing. And in addition to floats, Whipper offers nearly every type of service you can imagine, from maintenance to avionics, paint, and interior work. We visited their South St. Paul facility uh, and factory many years ago and have a video about that. If you're ever in the area, coordinate with them, check it out. It is so cool to see all of that in action. Now to tonight's guest. As president of Hartzell Propeller, J.J. Friggy is responsible for every aspect of the business, including the development and education of Hartzell's strategy and the way that they deliver on that commitment that Hartzell Propellers are built on honor. A veteran of over 13 years at the company, J.J. understands how to provide quality products and outstanding customer support while ensuring the financial success of the company as well. And that can be very difficult to do in the specialized market we have here in general aviation. So it really does matter that these companies thrive and survive and that they can support all of us at the same time. He's active in the general aviation community as well as his local community as a board member on the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, past president of the United Way of Miami County, the Miami County Humane Society, and dedicating 15 years to coaching youth sports, which touches me personally. I've always been involved in coaching, and, and I really have quite a bit of respect for someone that dedicates their time in that manner. You always have to check out and uh, take off from work in order to make it happen. And for someone at JJ's level to go and do that for youth sports uh, is, is quite meaningful. JJ applies the lessons learned from sports in his leadership at Hartzell, how to win and lose with grace, determination, hard work, and what it means to be a team. As someone with years of experience with Hartzell Propellers and the Hartzell team, I can honestly tell you that general aviation is a richer community for the work and leadership that J.J. Friggy provides. I am thrilled to call him a friend, have him with us here tonight. Please welcome to Social Flight Live, J.J. Friggy. Hey, J.J., how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. How are you, Jeff? Excellent. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. I know how busy you are. <laughs> 
You bet. Uh, I, I'm really thrilled to be here. I appreciate you having me. Thanks. Um, I want to lead off with something. Uh, I, you know, we mentioned uh, during the uh, the introduction, of course, that you're a board member on Gamma, and uh, uh, Pete Bunce, uh, the the president uh, of the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, Gamma. Um, we we've been fighting this thing for the industry. You know, you do a lot of work for the industry. Gamma does a ton of work for the industry, and along with um, Mike Bush and AOPA and the work I've been doing and. And, and the entire group, Pete has really led a charge against something we've done a couple shows on here recently called uh, the Moss Interpretation. And uh, the Moss Interpretation really threatened how general aviation maintenance happens because it was redefining how supervision happened uh, that could have really completely stopped owner maintenance uh, and how uh, we do AMP training, just about everything that way. And I want to announce to all our viewers that literally two hours ago, um, we just received a letter from the FAA that will be public that you will start seeing tomorrow. And that letter uh, reads uh, in part after talking to about the, and uh, referring to the regulation in question, that they are issuing a stay of the Moss interpretation, that the Moss interpretation uh, now uh, is, is on hold. Uh, it does not represent a conclusion uh, to this, but it will not be enforced until they have time to uh, really go through this, hopefully along with the industry, and um, and come up with a good thing. So, so a thanks to to Pete, uh, to the industry, to Mike Bush, to everyone who's worked on this, and uh, and thanks to you for your role on the board of Gamma as well. Certainly, that's great news. So, um, I want to talk, of course, about uh, uh, your background in Hartzell. Um, Hartzell is a remarkably historic company. Uh, I, I always knew that it was, but the more I dug into it, the more my mind kept getting blown about how far back this really goes and what impact in general aviation history Hartzell has had. Can you give me a few points that can, and then maybe I'll go through a couple I saw uh, here? Sure, be happy to. So you, yeah, you mentioned, actually Hartzell Propeller goes back to 1917. Uh, the Hartzell family was working a lumber mill in Pickwell, Ohio, and their friends, neighbors down in Dayton happened to be the Wright family. So Orville Wright and company uh, had just started the Dayton Wright Airplane Company. And instead of dropping out of university to go be a barnstormer, George Hartzell convinced his son, Robert Hartzell, to stay with the family business, stay in university, and start a propeller division in their in their lumber mill. So our first customer was Orville Wright with the Dayton Wright Airplane Company. And, you know, we we quickly got started with not just them, but also the World War One effort with some with some propellers for the military. And then, you know, fast forward into World War II, we did a lot of contract manufacturing for Hamilton Standard in support of the war effort with metal bladed propellers, and then started to develop our carbon fiber composite technology in the in the mid to late 70s and as we look at our portfolio today and, and really the company it, it's really a story about innovation and continuing to kind of push the limits of material properties and and how we can design better performing propeller systems that that provide great value to customers uh, and you know one of the things i was actually really surprised at as i did uh, some more deeper research into the company i didn't realize hartzell actually produced aircraft at one point uh, that that back in it looks like in the twenties you had a couple aircraft. We did, and we we quickly decided uh, it was the FC one was the model, and we quickly decided we didn't want to compete with the rest of our customer base. Yeah. So we we shut down the the aircraft design and production, and just focused on the propeller system design and production, and and obviously continued to take on customers and airframers. Uh, it's it really is impressive, and and as you look at some of the firsts, you've got things like uh, a first a, a rigid airship propeller for the USS Shenandoah, um, right. but I also saw 1946 an aircraft that that I happen to think is just so wonderful. When I, every time I see it at, at Air Venture, that that Hartzell created the first controllable prop for the uh, on the Ryan Navion. Yeah, yeah. If you can believe it, the Navion goes all the way back to the mid '40s, and and certainly uh, controllable pitch, right? So we take it for granted now, but originally everything was fixed pitch. You know, not able to change pitch or have any sort of uh, pitch change control system during flight, and that was the our our first system that we were able to control pitch and and obviously maximize performance then as we go through the different phases of flight. 
and and I think one of the things that it, it that's it's so revolutionary the idea that you could essentially have gears on a plane you know that you change its pitch and control what you can do but even that there was a period of time between 46 and then 49 that you could control the pitch but it wasn't until 49 that Hartzell actually created the first T drive and and governor to make it not just variable pitch but constant speed yeah that's right so really uh, combining the hydromechanical uh, controls into a, a unit that would uh, really hone in on a, on, a, on a particular RPM, as you said, constant speed, and match up the pitch of the propeller blades to, to make that uh, RPM consistent. So yeah, I mean, it was a great, you know, we call ourselves a propeller design company, but we're, we're definitely intimately familiar with the control side on the prop governors as well. Well, you you sell governors as well, right? I mean, our our the governor that we've got is a Hartzell. It, it actually yeah, comes bet. comes from you, yeah. and I think a lot of people don't realize the intimate uh, connection between how your governor works and how your constant speed propeller works, and how important it is, especially if you're doing an overhaul, that you're that both of those are are given the same start kind of fresh clean start so you're not looking pointing at which ones have given me the problem that's right yeah we we obviously have a, a time between overhaul for our propeller systems it's extremely important to follow those manuals and and have those uh maintenance events done at overhaul cycle and also same on the governor to your point so you know, we, we, we recommend, um, you know, a, a standard TBO on governors as well, depending on the model. And certainly when you're taking your prop off to, to have it overhaul, it's a great time to, to have that governor come off and, and send it in for overhaul as well. Yeah, I, I think I, I've written about this before in my OPA column, but I, I really sincerely believe it, that propellers are not given the due reverence that they that they really deserve and and should command because the forces that they're under, the uh, what they actually do, the fact they are a single point essentially at the pointy end of the spear of of potential failure if you don't care for it properly, um, and and what they really mean to performance just cannot be overstated. So tell me a little bit about what goes into on your end of the, uh, there at Hartzell, what goes into design and manufacturing and and how how you care for these propellers? Yeah, it's a, it's a great observation. And, you know, to be honest, safety culture uh, of our employees, you know, and how we work together is extremely important as it is in every manufacturing company. But the safety culture around our product and what we're putting out in market is is just as important uh, in, in our case. You know, the the FAA has a, a list of components and parts that they deem to be flight critical. And every component of a propeller is considered to be flight critical. It's a, you know, give or take 120 to 150 parts that go under propeller. And, you know, many of them are, are moving at, at high, high speed, you know, under RPM with centrifugal force and loading. And so we've got to be, you know, really focused on the quality and safety side when we start our designs. So what's worked well for us is to have a core system, whether that's on the steel hub side with the steel hub, pilot tubes, and then clamps that, that bolt the blade, that, that affix the blade to the hub on the steel clamp, uh, excuse me, steel retention side, or on the aluminum clamps to style shell, shell system. Um, we really have spent a lot of time honing the uh, virtues of those systems and then just versioning those out. Because when you do a clean sheet, you know, you've got to look at your FEA, you've got to look at where your fault modes are, and certainly we do clean sheets as well. Um, but really designing for safety and designing for manufacturability and repeatability and high quality is, is something that we really focus on every time that we are endeavoring to design, you know, a new system or version out a system that we already have. So I guess I would say every metal part that goes into a propeller goes through a non-destructive testing, whether that's an eddy current for steel parts or a powder coat black light process to look for cracks and blemishes on aluminum parts. Uh, you know, we build safety into everything that we do uh, from, from the design to the certification, which we can also do ourselves through our ODA that we partner with the FAA on to the production. And then certainly the service and support side with our, recommended overhaul cycles and, and annual maintenance and those sort of things. So 
uh, as you said, we're, we're the point of the spear for getting an airplane in the air and keeping it in the air. And we want to make sure that uh, safety is paramount throughout the entire process. Yeah, uh, it, it is. It is such a, an important point, I think, to make. And, and you mentioned it being flight critical. I, I mean, it, the FAA guidance and, and the regulations around what people can do with different components of an aircraft, I think, make that so clear. As a licensed mechanic, I can, I can do a complete major overhaul on an engine. I can tear the, comp the, the thing completely down. But what I can't do is open up a propeller. <laughs> and right. there's a reason for that. And can you give me some examples as to why that is so flight critical that uh, mechanics can't just open up a propeller or do, do an overhaul themselves? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it's pretty simple. You know, it's a specialized piece of equipment, right, that's type designed to, to perform a mission. And we, we have to make sure that as a propeller manufacturer, we're providing uh, the manuals and the support for that propeller to be looked after through its entire life cycle. So when we talk about the value equation that we offer to customers, a lot of that uh, goes into the manuals that we write and the overhaul criteria and overhaul timing that, that we dial into our propeller system. So again, everything that we do is uh, that goes onto an, a certified airplane is a certified propeller application. On the Hartzell propeller side, even when we're installing on an experimental aircraft like a Vans or an RV, that still has a, a certified pedigree to it from a propeller system standpoint. So I think it's it's really important that you know we're as we care for the prop all through its life cycle um, that we have special manuals, we have special criteria, we have a special set of um, overhaul guidelines that that we own and publish to the overhaul community in the, on the propeller side, the propeller MRO world, and and we actually train the field, not just our own employees through our service center, but we actually train the field to care for our product because it is, it, as, as our chief pilot used to say, it's, it's not a washing machine, right? When, <laughs> when something breaks, you don't call the repairman and, and have it fixed. When something breaks, it's a bad day uh, on a propeller. And, and we, we want to make sure that we have, uh, you know, layers of safety built in, layers of quality built in, and layers of inspections and maintenance and overhaul cycles such that we don't have those opportunities for, for the bad day. Um, so our manuals are, are really important to us. Uh, we update those quarterly or more often if needed, and we are publishing those to the field to part 145 shops all over the world for them to go then and care for our product according to those manuals and processes and procedures. So you're right, a, a, an engine mechanic you know, isn't technically qualified to work on a propeller, but but it's it's also something that we're trying to make available to the field, again, in a safety culture type of environment where we want you as a customer to be able to go to a regional center of excellence to have your propeller worked on. We want you to have accessible MRO events such that you're not spending months of downtime because you're you had a you know had a prop issue. So mm -hmm. we're really interested in educating the field and making sure that there is a good training regimen and a high quality standard out there um, outside of just what we do in the factory from an overhaul standpoint. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because uh, ultimately we need to have a really good educational cooperation between the, the frontline maintenance facilities out there, the folks like myself and others that are out there working on aircraft. So we really understand. So the right grease is used. So the props are not over grease. So things are maintained properly. So we know what to do in different situations, how to balance a prop dynamically, all these different types of things. But at the same time, I've been inside a prop shop. I would encourage anyone who's anywhere near one, if they can get a tour to do that, because as you mentioned, it's so flight critical. Every component ends up with non-destructive testing. Every component get specialized measurements and things that just can't have happen randomly out there in the field. And that's why we as mechanics in the field, as opposed to a repair station, a propeller repair station, are not certified to actually open it up and reseal it or do something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, it, it's, it, it's also, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me, I guess, how much goes into it. W tell me a little bit about the development process because you guys have come out with quite a few new new designs and new propellers. I've seen more come out of Hartzell. It's 
uh, than, than maybe even you see coming out of the experimental world. Like you are always coming out with a new prop, new application, something really cool, um, which I love seeing coming from a certified products company. Uh, tell yeah. me what goes into it, how this happens. Well, you know, it starts with a, a really strong design uh, with material properties that that tend to outperform the competitive set, right? So carbon fiber, for example, or aerospace grade aluminum, we try to use the best materials available to us to design the propeller so that it outperforms and it performs at a high quality way. Uh, so, so that's kind of the first piece um, around our, our design philosophy. And then as far as getting to market, we really have a, what I call a three-legged stool. So we partner uh, very high upstream with OEMs like Pilatus and Cirrus and Piper and Dyer and, and you know, Air Tractor and, and all these companies that, that are the, the leaders in general aviation in terms of uh, aircraft production. We're partnering with them upstream so that we can type design for the mission, right? A Cirrus, Cirrus wants to go fast and you know, uh, a dyer wants to go fast and an air tractor wants to be able to yank and bank and have great low end thrust. So we have the capability with our analytical tools and our engineering team to be able to design specific for the mission uh, to achieve max performance. And so for us, the best combination at that uh, OEM level is to partner with not only the airframer, but also the engine manufacturer uh, and then really develop an optimized system that's, that's meeting the mission profile for that particular platform. So that's kind of the first leg of this tool. We're invested with our engineering team at the upstream level with our OEM and engine partners to design specific for the mission. Then when we think about the aftermarket and the installed base, we have our top prop program, which uh, is, a, is a great collection of over 100 different STCs that we have, which really are, are new props going on to existing airplanes to make that airplane better in some form or fashion, whether that's low end takeoff and climb, like we do with the Trailblazer propeller across some different STCs that we have, or whether that's uh, you know high end performance on, on cruise, like we've done with some of our five blade composite STCs. Uh, we really, again, design for that particular airplane and what we know about the user base. And then we're able to, to STC that again, through our own ODA with the FAA and bring those props to market through our top prop portfolio. And then the third leg of the stool is really partnering with modifiers and, uh, and customers out there like Whip Air, uh, who have a great engineering department themselves and are really invested in growing the GA category and have a ton of know-how and knowledge around a particular platform like the Caravan, for example, where they wanna, they wanna do the STC program themselves and bring that product to market. And so we provide to them a, a fully type certificated propeller that's approved for that airplane. And then they go, to, go do the test flying and get the STC and sell that STC into the market for that, for that airplane. So really you think about the, the partnership at the OEM level, that top prop portfolio of STCs that we bring to market and then working with modifiers for them to, to, to fund and support STCs and bring to market. That's what I like to call the three-legged stool of, of how we bring props to customers. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. I, I, I like that. Now, how, how difficult is it to try to balance all the factors that you need to when you're designing a new propeller? Because my understanding is You've got uh, static thrust, climb performance. You've got cruise performance. You've got noise issues that you've got to deal with. Um, I'm sure there's a cost factor, of course, and, and manufacturability that goes into it. There's probably a myriad of ones that I'm not even mentioning. How in the world do you weigh those and somehow come out with a winner? Like this is the combination we're going to do. Yeah, another a really good question. So we have some really solid analytical tools. Um, the biggest, uh, probably the most unique and proprietary to us is something that we call prop code, which is a homegrown uh, set of calculations that we can uh, reference, uh, which you know we're looking for inputs like horsepower and diameter and RPM, and then the shape of the airfoil we can change. Um, we can also incorporate uh, you know, the blockage associated with the cowling or the inlet, those sorts of things. And so it'll spit out some thrust predictions that, that we found over time as we've honed the tools and honed the inputs to be pretty re highly reliable. And so mm -hmm. 
um, that's that's kind of the first gate that we go through uh, around the, the analytical tools to design a propeller and and then we can version it out again we can you know I, I like to say physics don't change but we can certainly twist the knobs with the design to say hey we want to go faster so um, let's let's put a little bit more twist or less twist into the blade that's going to cause us maybe to lose a little bit of efficiency on low end takeoff and climb but it's going to make it go faster when you get to cruise altitude yeah and so we can play around with these things analytically and make sure that we're dialing in our our best possible design on paper and then we've got especially in the composite world where you're investing in a closed tool a, a closed cavity tool and you and really you're locking in your geometry before you know you ever go and fly anything it's really important to have pretty good fidelity in those analytical tools so we spend a lot of time really making sure that tools are working well for us um, and we gut check that within actual flight testing. So right. many times we'll go do and do a metal prototype of something that we're going to do in composite because we're able to cut a metal part, a metal blade, and uh, test that out before we sync the the tool for the composite production. Um, but so as we transition then from the analytical tools, it's always great to go flight test and make sure that we're confirming those types of things and those types of performance metrics that we're going after. So, you know, flight testing is super important to us. We have, <coughs> excuse me, a flight test department of engineers um, that not only do performance flight testing, but they do vib vibration, uh, vibrational survey flight testing. Um, that's part of one of the TC criteria and STC criteria is to make sure that our particular propeller is uh, vibrationally approved on that particular airframe and engine combination. So that's one of the re reports that goes into every FAA, TC, or STC for a propeller onto an airplane uh, is a vibrational approval uh, as well as the, the, you know, the flight testing to support the performance metrics of that particular platform. And then finally, on the composite side, uh, we spend a lot of time looking at the fidelity and integrity of the blade design itself because whereas metal, it's a unique uh, single structure piece of aluminum, in composite, you've got dozens of layers of carbon fiber laid up over a solid foam core, uh, integrated into a, a stainless steel uh, shank with a nickel cobalt leading edge. So you've got these different characteristics of, of materials you're using, and we need to make sure that the, the fatigue of uh, pedigree of that blade will uh, withstand what we what we call an unlimited cycle uh, from a life a lifing point of view. So uh, 70,000 type of flight hours is what the FAA calls unlimited life. And so uh, we're, we're as we look at bringing composite blades to market, we're not only looking at the airfoil, we're also looking at the construction of that blade to make sure that we've got from a fatigue and allowable standpoint an, un, an unlimited life blade. So I know I, I rambled a bit there, but there's a lot that goes into the science of uh, of the blade design using analytical tools, flight testing, and then a bunch of certification testing before we're ready to get to market. No, I think I think that is exactly why it is such. I it's funny you use the word science for it, which it certainly is, and yet I think of it as much science as I do as kind of the the black arts of of propeller design because there seem to be such infinite number of variables involved. I almost wonder, and I'm curious about this, if you think, based on what you've seen during your tenure, of how you've learned that the model has to evolve to get better and better, do, if you think that now with, with AI and, and new data models and all sorts of other things that are coming, um, if you think that this is gonna be an area that changes a lot, that, that the propellers that you see a decade from now from Hartzell will may look different and perform even better. I think it's possible, you know, on a couple of fronts, the analytical tools matched up then to to verify via actual flight testing. I think that's I'll come back to that in a second. But I also think from a material property standpoint, so long as those boundaries are being pushed and we're and we're innovating as a as an industry around material properties, whether it's you know, uh, a better, higher, stronger uh, carbon fiber or some new type of uh, layup process that enables us to maintain the structural integrity of the blade, but design even thinner 
uh, leading edges or wider airfoils and still pass certification criteria. So material properties are certainly going to continue to evolve. So I think that will unlock some doors and, and open some paths to better performance. And then, as you said, you know, on the on the actual tools, I think one of the big breakthroughs has been CFD or computational fluid dynamics and understanding how airstreams uh, created by a propeller move across the rest of the airframe, especially on you know traditional tractor type of, of aircraft with the prop on the front of the airplane. And so I think that there's definitely some potential to version out some better performance based on continuing to model these airstreams and how we can limit the drag or reduce the drag of the airstreams across the fuselage and across the airframe uh, with propeller uh, geometry. You know, the, uh, some of the other things we're looking at are how we can how we can maximize air into the inlet, right? So the engine performs better and effectively turns out more horsepower. So there's all these things that we're continuing to look at and be curious about. Um, and as the tools evolve and as you know, we continue flight testing. I think for sure that's been our pedigree. To be honest, Jeff, that's that's what's made us successful is kind of that continual learning environment and wanting to get a little bit better tomorrow than we are today. So absolutely, I, th I think we'll continue to to push the boundaries. I love that 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 you are always pushing into that area because it, it seems it, it seems to be one of the fastest evolving things that really affect performance uh, on an aircraft. Now, obviously one of the most dynamic parts of that have been the introduction of the carbon fiber props, the navigator that we use in the Bonanza, bill, all these other things. Um, do you see carbon fiber being the, the future? Will one eclipse the other? Will something actually get to the point? Uh, or, or is it just, in other words, if it were a cost thing, then perhaps at some point cost would, dynamic would change to make it possible for everyone? Or is it really that there's a different prop for a different situation? You know, um, there's definitely different props and different materials for different situations. You know, I think um, the ag market, for example, is a is a really is a really interesting and unique market that is, that I believe is going to want to continue to utilize metal belated propellers because of the risk associated with it, right? So you're doing a lot of yanking and banking. You're bringing in the the risk of power lines quite frequently. And, you know, a metal bladed propeller is just by definition going to be uh, stronger and with able to withstand uh, a, a line strike or a wire strike um, by cutting the wire and, and having, I'll say, usually non-catastrophic, you know, type of damage to the blades, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll get it all twisted up and it's not a great day. Um, but you don't see any shearing typically on the blade uh, in that type of event. But if you're talking about a carbon fiber blade, um, you've got great strength vertically through the blade, but horizontally, if you strike a wire, there's you know quite quite the risk of that having some sort of a shear impact to the blade, and you know maybe cutting the blade or gouging the blade pretty significantly. So. I think just from a mission profile standpoint, there are certain applications and certain variants within GA that are going to want to continue to maintain, you know, metal as the preferred option. However, like the what, survivability side uh, of it in terms of like how they fail. Um, correct. Case, yeah. 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 Failure modes for sure. Uh, however, I, I would I would offer you this. When I started at Heart Soul 13 years ago, um, we were making you know, of our total blade production, it was about 95% metal blades and mm -hmm. less than 10% composite carbon fiber blades. Today, we are essentially 50-50. Um, yeah. Still slightly skewed towards metal, uh, maybe 60, maybe 55, 45, but the trend has been very significant towards carbon fiber. And, you know, I think it's it's a reflection of some of the benefits of of those systems where you can add a blade, go from a four blade metal to a five blade carbon fiber and actually still reduce your weight, but increase your performance threshold, right? right. And so, you know, um, going from a three blade metal to a three blade carbon fiber, you're gonna save weight. Um, you're gonna, you know, ha have, a, have a value equation that, that enables you to have an unlimited life propeller where, you know, the, the big advantage of carbon fiber is it's got a higher acquisition cost out of the gate but mm -hmm. when you go through an overhaul cycle, you're not grinding away metal, you're not grinding away carbon fiber, 
you're essentially not making that blade smaller and you're not going to put it at risk for going under dimension and needing to be replaced. You're actually adding material back to it and restoring it to its factory new dimension through the overhaul cycle. So you've still got a great performing blade that is ex uh, exactly within dimension of when it came out of the mold. And it's, it's certified through our fatigue process to be uh, an unlimited life. So you can continue to overhaul it. You know, we've got uh, blades and props that have gone through a dozen overhauls in our uh, some of our early models and you know approaching you know tens of thousands of flight hours uh, that continue to go back into service because you know they're being restored to factory dimension and and all the ultrasonic testing checks out fine so um, a long-winded version of saying the the market is shifting towards uh, a carbon fiber type of uh, persuasion but there will definitely be, you know, some traditional and, and uh, individual markets that are, are going to continue to go with metal bladed props. There's a perception in the maintenance field uh, that the aluminum, traditional aluminum blades are um, uh, perhaps more, more susceptible to small damage, uh, but more resilient to harder damage, like like it hitting a, a you know taking a, a nick on on someone forgets to take the tow bar off when they go to start it or something like that, and but also have a lot more field uh, ability to do stuff in the field versus composite, not not really eroding much in service, not you know being stronger for that, but less maintenance in there, but at the same time if you do hit something they're much more vulnerable to catastrophic damage. Uh, is, is there any truth to that or, or is, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I think it's very dependent on the situation, but what I would say in principle is that there's a, definitely a comfort factor with metal bladed props, right? You, you bring a file along with you, you file out, you know, the blemish or the nick or the scrape or the, or the gouge and, and you feel okay about going on your way. What, what I would say about carbon fiber is, is that the leading edge on that carbon fiber blade is is where over 80 percent of any sort of impacts are, are typically occurring right and so you think about that nickel cobalt leading edge it's 10 times stronger than than aluminum mm. and so um, it, one of the things that a lot of our customers don't know is that when we paint those carbon fiber blades we only leave about a half inch of that leading edge exposed and so a lot of people think that that's all the wider it is when mm. in fact uh, our leading edges range from about an inch and a half to over two inches wide per side. So you're getting really, really good coverage with a nickel cobalt leading edge on a composite blade. And, and that is providing, you know, from a, a strength standpoint, 10 times better protection than uh, a traditional metal blade would. So um, we, we see uh, a lot of advantages uh, even in you know the the higher dirtier runway scenarios uh, where carbon fiber with the nickel cobalt leading edge is is a preferred option, so I would say you know again a comfort factor many 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 decades worth of uh, experience with aluminum bladed props and they hold up very well and and you're right there is an ease to uh, a field event where you can file that out, um, but on the on the composite side we also have some pretty uh, healthy allowables where, you know, if you're familiar with our manuals and familiar with those allowables, uh, you can feel very comfortable very quickly with uh, dressing that out in the field, right, with uh, with this minor uh, carbon fiber minor repair kit and being on your way just like you would with a metal prop if, yeah. if you have something that needs addressed. I've, I've also been really impressed. It, 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 my experience really does mirror what you just said, where you're in a, with an aluminum prop, you're used to just doing a lot of filing. But you see, at the same time, you're used to doing it because it's happening all the time. Like you're yeah. always used to dressing out props. You're always used to getting those nicks. I had no idea that the nickel edge extended so far. I thought it was yeah. pretty much what's being shown through the paint. And that explains why there's so little wear that I've yep. actually experienced, even on the blade face, which um, that's right. uh, for those who are not familiar with the blade face, that's the part that kind of faces you in the cockpit on a tractor design, on a traditional design. Um, uh, and, and that's where you get so much abrasion from maybe small, tiny pieces that get picked up of sand and grit or things like that. 
and I've really been impressed at how little wear happens when it's a given with an aluminum blade that you're just yep. going to have a rough face. Yep. Yeah, and on the composite blades, a lot of times what we find is, you know, there there may be uh, some superficial scratches or or little dings, but it's not into the carbon fiber at all. Um, and so you really don't have anything to worry about. You can touch that up with paint in many cases and be on your way. One of the other th things that we do on our carbon fiber blades in, in many of the applications um, is we have a, a mesh erosion screen that we put uh, outside of the uh, carbon layers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, bef we co-cure a mesh erosion screen that really absorbs uh, all the way through, especially the outboard section of the blade, behind the leading edge, um, it, it absorbs and is able to kind of shield the blade from any of the more you know, moderate type of FOD that you might see. So you might get something that gets through the paint layer and into the mesh erosion screen layer, and you might need to address that at an overhaul cycle, uh, but that mesh erosion screen can be taken off and replaced uh, through, through a normal composite overhaul. Wow. Now, you, in addition to, to the certified work, uh, Hartzell does, has done quite a bit, has a, has a really, really storied history in uh, one-offs, as you mentioned, the experimental world. You do a lot of work with air show performers, uh, you know, like uh, Sean D. Tucker, Mike Goulian, both friends of the show. Um, amazing work. But you actually did the propellers for uh, Dick Rutan's of, and Bert Rutan's Voyager flight. Um, and uh, Dick was on the show prior to him passing away. And he, he told the story a little bit about that. Can you tell me and reiterate some of how Hartzell saved the day for that flight? Yeah, you know, uh, Dick visited Hartzell probably uh, six or eight years ago uh, during our one of our long service events and, and told the story of, of the of the Voyager trip and just had 350 Hartzell employees completely captivated for for two hours uh, while he went through the story. Um, and, you know, our part of that was that uh, about two weeks before the uh, flight, the, the flight where he circumnavigated the, the globe, uh, he had a catastrophic prop failure with our competitors' props. So he to, uh, didn't be able to handle the weight of the Hartzell prop, but gosh, I I have had this failure and I need some help. And designed new mission specific prop. Um, you know, he was on his way, and we we delivered them to uh, to him, and uh, the rest is as they say history. So cool. It, it is really amazing. Um, and, and and I know your your connection broke up just just for a second during that. So I just want to clarify that. What he talked about is that he had this failure, and how how quick was it? Because it was an amazing turnaround time that Hartzell was able to provide both front and rear propellers yes. to the Voyager. Yeah, it was essentially 10, 10 days. Wow. So less than two full weeks um, from a, a Monday to the following Friday when we delivered the props. That's amazing. <laughs> um, one of the other things that I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm really happy about, really impressed by, uh, so Hartzell has now, uh, with the acquisition of Whirlwind Propeller, started to move into the area uh, of experimental propellers as well. And... Um, and in fact, one of the things everybody's going to get to see now is uh, Hartzell uh, uh, sponsoring with the Whirlwind Four Blade Reproduction Propeller here on our Mustang project. Uh, we're uh, ready to do firewall forward, and so you're going to see that that amazing reproduction propeller. And Whirlwind now being part of Hartzell, I think uh, I was really fascinated by this move because uh, you know propellers, as we mentioned in the beginning. Are, are such a safety issue, such a, a, a performance, and, 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 and there's so much engineering built into it. And the idea that you're going to take the, the kind of, all the power of Hartzell Propeller with engineering support, warranty support, uh, uh, technical support, and ongoing, you know, how do you keep these blades going? 
and be able to apply it now to, to advance an already good design with Whirlwind. Um, tell me a little bit about that move. Did we lose you, JJ? If someone could chime in and let me know if he is frozen for you or if it is just for me. JJ, are you there? Picking up. I... Oh, now, we, now we've now we got you. I am. I, I You just came back in. Sorry about that. No problem. Did you get my question? Uh, no, I, I just caught the bits and pieces about Whirlwind. So um, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about it, it seems like a wonderful option opportunity now. Um, I mentioned that obviously we're, we're going to be using the, uh, the Whirlwind uh, Reproduction 4 blade on the Mustang here, and Hartzell, with your acquisition of Whirlwind, is going to be taking all uh, of the engineering re types of resources, technical support, standardization, all these wonderful things that you use in the certified world and applying it to help the experimental world as well. Tell me a little bit about what that means to Hartzell and to the market. Right. So I think that the first thing I'd say is, you know, Whirlwind comes with a very, very great pedigree in terms of the product and how it's performed in market and the brand organically. For us, we were really interested in in partnering um, and acquiring that product line because it's a great complement to what we do on the certified side. And so, of course, Whirlwind is all experimental, um, which comes with its, you know, its its own design criteria and and philosophies um uh, without the all the certified uh you know requirements um but for us you know we're deeply committed to to really learning about the product portfolio and the advantages um, and the applications where it's a really good option uh and continuing to grow that out on the commercial side and and, and broadening the distribution to a, a wider consumer base uh, you know, I think for, for us, again, it's it's a great entrant into the fixed pitch ground adjustable side for carbon fiber. It's a, a really fun entrant into the airboat market for us, which we've never experienced before. And it's going to give us the opportunity to to learn, um, you know, uh, uh, some some things that that uh, we haven't experienced before in terms of how how you design some of those those lower end horsepower systems, uh, but also then start to apply. Uh, quality standards and overhaul criteria to this great product um, to to make sure that we're again looking after it for, for through its full life cycle like we do with the heart soul uh, brand yeah I mean that's one of the one of the coolest things now because I've always I take a very conservative approach into the experimental market right there's areas that as a builder you want to experiment in and those should be areas that the builder is comfortable and the builder feels they have expertise or the resources for expertise in. And then there's other areas that you don't want to be experimenting if you're not qualified to or if you're, you don't have the resources to go. And very, very few people, if any, none I, I've met, have the resources to truly be experimenting with propellers and, right. and with propeller design. And so that seems like one that unless you are one of the very special breed that knows everything involved in that science and that art to keep yourself safe, um, we really need companies we can rely on to get propellers that, that we can rely on now, rely on into the future, and we know we'll be service and support as well as time goes by. And so it, that really seems like a great move for me. Uh, and also the fact that it gets you involved in things like Rotax aircraft, right? Rotax yeah. powered things. Right. Uh, yeah. First of all, if you are the that rare individual that has everything figured out in terms of propellers, please call me. We're always looking to add talent to our to our company. That'd be a fantastic addition. Uh, but you're right. You know, the Rotax, there's over 50,000 airplanes in the market today in general aviation with Rotax engines, and, and we're on exactly this many of them, zero. 
And so, you know, the combination of uh, whirlwind on the experimental side, as well as a clean sheet design that we're working on as an entrant into the Rotax market has us really excited because not only are there 50,000 aircraft and engines out there already, but it's certainly a, a growing market. Um, and, and, you know, many traditional OEMs are now looking at Rotax as, you know, a potential lighter weight engine, lower horsepower option for some of their platforms. So certainly we think that's going to be an area of growth in the coming years for for GA and specifically on the lighter side. Yeah, that will be really, really cool to see. And I can tell you, I've spent a fair amount of time uh, with different manufacturers on that side. And it really ranges from people that you talk to that really do seem to know what they're doing to people that you ask them questions about the propeller that they're selling for, for Rotax Experimental. And their answer is like, it looked good. Like it, right. it's, it's all over the map. Right. And, and, and right. the idea that we will be seeing in the future a Hartzell branded propeller that you guys stand behind and say, this is why, and yeah. have your data is pretty cool. Yeah. In fact, we just shipped our first uh, test, test hardware article to one of our strategic OEM partners to, to begin flight testing uh, on, the, on the Rotax engine and airframe variant. And I'm so excited. It's just a, a beautifully designed three-blade propeller. And uh, I think it's going to be a great performer. And it certainly, as you said, carry that certified pedigree uh, into, the, into this new market. Uh, absolutely. And I have to ask you something here. So we've talked about propeller design and, uh, and, and we've talked about all the different factors that go into it. Given all of that, given the fact that you're balancing noise and vibration and performance and climb and all these other things, at the same time, I have to say, when I come by and I look at especially the newer propellers, especially the, the you know carbon fiber propellers coming out of Hartzell, they are sexy as hell. I mean, when you're looking at these things on the ground, they look like they're going, you know, 300 miles an hour on the ground. How it, There must be. Is there some level that uh, of of how the thing looks that factors into your designs oh abso absolutely i would say you know 20 years ago not so much we we were known for you know paddle style uh you know type of blades that that looked very uh i'll say utilitarian might be the best word for it uh but you know with the with the advent of you know again the, the evolution of our design tools uh certainly dialing in performance and ramp appeal you know aesthetics is is part of the mission right i mean a lot of the a lot of the folks that are in the prop market are doing it because they want something that looks cool and you know is uh might might have a cool name associated with it uh or or and and it provides some performance benefits so yeah certainly ramp appeal and and aesthetics are, are go into every design that that we put out there that uh, it i mean it, I'm glad to hear it does, or I guess it, it could be either way, it, 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 but it is so true. I, I counsel people a lot uh, on what propeller to buy for their aircraft when, they have, when they've decided it's time to either upgrade or when there's a problem with the propeller that they, that they currently have on. And the factors I have them look at considering in that regard, certainly there is, there's performance. There's always going to be cost to some degree associated with it. They've got to look at all that. But I feel like they often miss what's involved in maintenance and owning, the, owning that. And so we do talk a lot about uh, who can service it. Uh, will they be able to service it in a, in a um, I guess, in a, a, a so, sort of a piecemeal fashion, meaning can, do you have the resources to only fix what's wrong when you need to? Because not all companies are cooperative about that, and Hartzell's really, really good about it. With, um, with supporting all the shops that are out there. And then also at the end of the day, you probably spend more time looking at your plane on the ground than you do in the air. <laughs> and yeah. it's cool if you're gonna spend a big chunk of your life savings on a prop, it is cool to be able to look at it and have it be beautiful. Oh yeah, absolutely. You spend a lot more time looking at it on the ramp or in the hangar than you do, uh, you know, in in the air. So certainly, yeah, ramp appeal and and designing for the, a bit of that cool or, or sexy factor is is important. Uh, and and before we move on to that last kind of topic of of looks and naming, I I don't want to have missed uh, hitting the point of 
of that maintenance side. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I have found as a mechanic in the field, this is becoming more and more of an issue throughout the entire industry where when someone has a, a, what I'll call a, a singular issue, uh, meaning no known issue except for one of the blades is starting to, to leak out or something. Um, uh, and they're more and more finding themselves up against a wall where prop shops are sometimes just saying, that's great, and but we don't touch anything. We just overhaul. Like, that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or parts aren't available or something like that, which can drive what could be uh, a very reasonable repair to something extra really, really expensive. And, and tell me about Hartzell's approach to this. Yeah, I mean, looking after product in the market is one of the ways we differentiate or try to differentiate versus our competition. So you mentioned parts availability. We ship over 90% of our aftermarket orders the same day or next day that we receive them, if that's what the customer wants, right? So we, we carry inventory that goes all the way back to the 50s and 60s for platforms and, and products that we want to make sure we have product on the shelf for when we get those phone calls and when a customer may have an issue. And, you know, the next piece of it is or kind of the next line of defense for us is our tech support team. So we have six full-time tech reps that will answer your phone calls 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or call you back within 10 minutes if they don't answer the phone off hours. And, you know, we back that up with a, a really strong warranty program. So every, every top prop comes with uh, a one year or uh, excuse me, a warranty through first overhaul. So anything uh, like you said, any sort of maintenance where it's a, a manufacturer defect or something that's that's going wrong, we're going to stand behind the product all the way through the first overall cycle, which is you know four, five, six years down the road. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's really important. And then if you're prop to us for service, not we're gonna we're gonna give you a two year warranty on that service, that MRO uh, event. And so you know. I would say, you know, first line of defense is putting a good quality product out in market. Second line is defense is putting, calling our tech support team and, and working through our warranty program if there is an issue. And and third line is, you know, get it into our one of our service centers. We now have several locations across the U.S., not just in Piqua where our headquarters is, but we also have factory-owned locations at Tiff in Tiffin, Ohio, American Propeller Service in Redding, California, and then Texas Aircraft Propeller down in the Houston area. And um, so we've got great facilities across the country. We want we want customers to be able to source locally and regionally again so they can minimize their downtime. Yeah. And, and, and the other thing I want to mention. The, I would say the next line of defense is what we call our recommended service facilities. Got it. And our recommended service facilities are our shops that we go out and audit every several years, make sure they're upholding our standards and abiding by our quality manuals and are really extensions of our factory service from a quality standpoint. Well, I, I really do appreciate and I think it's important how dedicated you are to supporting the the end customer there and and you know not taking advantage of them in that regard, just trying trying to to support them as best possible and and one last technical point i want to make there because i've faced this also a lot personally with many customers and supporting other people out there on something uh, a perfect example of your design supporting the market uh, and safety and reliability would be we've I've, I've written several articles on for example continental engines and uh issues with starter adapters starters kickback things like that and it all comes down to, in many cases, the propellers testing and design to meet moment of inertia minimums. Uh, and there, this is an area where you can buy a propeller, you can buy a lightweight propeller for an aircraft that doesn't meet those requirements and find yourself at risk of, of kickback damage, uh, of damage to your engine, damage to your, to your starter adapter. And without a doubt, even with Hartzell's composite lighter weight propellers. I did a lot of research with you guys. You always meet those specs to make sure people don't have to face that. Yeah, I think it's a, I appreciate you bringing that up. It's a really good point, Jeff. Um, we certainly design not only for the mission profile of the airplane, but also the limitations of the engine 
or the engine requirements, let's say. And in some cases with Continental, you, you have to have a minimum polar moment of inertia, uh, or to your point, you, you have the risk of, of, of harming your engine uh, with too light of a flywheel system. Um, Rotax has some limitations on the heavier side that we're, that we're managing against as we design props for Rotax. So the point is we pay attention uh, we don't want to invalidate your engine warranty or your, you know, anything associated with uh, something that might cause engine damage. So, um, again, that's that's one of the things that we do that differentiates us is that we're designing, uh, whether it's through a TC with the OEM or via STC into our top prop portfolio or supporting a modifier, we're going to make sure that that we are abiding by all the engine specs when we, when we have a prop uh, established for a particular platform. Yep. Well, it's absolutely fantastic, and as we are now approaching the top of the hour, I want, if you will bear with me, I want to do a little bit of a game here, uh, have some fun for everybody. You let me know off air something I had no idea. I knew all these named propellers with these cool names out there. I did not realize that there was a connection between the naming of the propeller, at least coincidentally, I don't know, you you'll, you'll tell me if it's coincidental or if it's intentional. And let's just say the uh, SUVs, minivans, things like that, there's an automotive connection to the naming of your props. So I yes, wanna play a little uh, game here. <laughs> the game here is Purely called- coincidental, yeah. <laughs> Did you say, what's that? Purely coincidental, but still funny, yeah. Purely coincidental, all right. Let's see how coincidental this is and if our audience believes this is coincidental. Because here's the game. It's called Name That Propeller. You and got we'll it. start right now. Okay, you ready? Yep. JJ Friggy, this is you on Social Flight Live with the game Name That Propeller. And we are going to start with this. <laughs> Come on, that's a trailblazer. <laughs> that's right. That is correct. That is that is the trailblazer propeller from Hartzell. Yep. Um, correct. Absolutely. Okay. Next propeller. Name that propeller. That's the path. That's the Pathfinder. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. That is the Hartzell Pathfinder propeller. A beautiful right. one, as you see here. On uh, on it looks like looks like a carbon cub something like that that that's on that is a cool looking propeller I will say mm -hmm. absolutely okay there is. next up name that propeller the Explorer that's what I that's drive right. Jeff come on <laughs> that is the Hartzell Explorer the Explorer propeller. Jeff that's what I drive <laughs> that's right okay next up here. Yep. Name that propeller. You got it. Ooh, that's your prop. That's the Navigator. That is. That's right. And that's our aircraft. That is that's the your prop, Jeff. That's the Navigator. Navigator, yeah. composite propeller available for uh, beach uh, bonanzas and the, and I'm sure many other aircraft. Um, damn sexy looking propeller, if I do say so. Okay, here's another one. Name that, that propeller. That's one of the newest. That's the Yukon. Absolutely. As we mentioned, Whip Air's uh, ST seed for caravans, the, uh, uh, the the Yukon, this thing, oh my God, the specs that they talked about, what this changes in jumping off the water, they literally were going to call this something else that had to do with just ripping out stumps, but it is it, it is a fantastic propeller. Okay. As we continue Listen, to roll 20... along. Right. Here we go. Go ahead. Name that propeller. <laughs> that's that's going to be one of our newest ones. That's the Town and Country. <laughs> no, that's the Voyager. Oh, oh I finally I, I finally got you on one. I couldn't believe it. Okay, we got that. That is it. That's a beautiful propeller with a heck of a picture there. Yeah. Here we go. Name yeah, that that's propeller. the Odyssey. That's the Odyssey on the on the Diamond DA40NG. Oh. oh, sorry, on the Cirrus SR22T. Excuse me. Yeah. There we go. That's right. The the now you can't tell me this is a coincidence. This is we we've got more. We're not done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about this one? Oh my goodness. What is that? That show me the show me the airplane. That is an 
Eagle Talon. Ah, there you go. From the okay. 1990s. I knew Good I could find you. one. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. That's one of our uh, our newest STCs, not quite in market yet, on the Gamebird GB1 uh, aerobatic airplane. So, so cool. Okay, so I know this next one is not official, but you have a, a new propeller out, two-blade composite propeller from Mooney Aircraft. For all you Mooney guys out there, all you folks, um, uh, this is you're going to want this. So two-blade composite propeller. You've got it down to a list of, I think, five that you have people voting on. Yep. And yeah, it's so in I want to put in my right book. now. Yep. What, yep. What's it down to? Uh, you're right. Top five choices uh, right out okay. on our social media right now. You can go check it out and vote for your uh, preferred name. Okay, so I'm putting my vote in, and there's my vote. You got it. <laughs> my vote is the Dodge I'll stop believing, Jeff. I, I want to see the journey. I want to see it named the journey. <laughs> I do right. too. That's and, a that'd be a great name. Last for it. one. I wanted to put one in for the wish list. So um, uh, this this is what I want to see for the. Whoops, I put the wrong thing up there. Uh, uh, that oh, that's the prop. That's the prop for the journey, right? If I win, if I be if it becomes yep, the journey. Yeah. Yep. And then that's here right. is here's my my wish list uh, uh, for uh, for for one here. You mentioned earlier, we need a Hartzell prop called the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the Town of Country. I'm thinking something like this that could hang in people's offices. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Looks good. Look at that brass leading edge. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit of a difference, a bit of a breakaway from, from composite. It technically is composite in design, I suppose. Um, multiple yeah. materials. <laughs> you bet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, JJ, thank you so much for taking time to join us here tonight on Social Flight Live. It's been absolutely fascinating. I am grateful for um, everything that Hartzell does for general aviation, your support of the industry, your support of uh, Social Flight. Uh, there's going to be a lot more to come where we're going to show people a lot more, especially with that uh, uh, with that new prop for the Mustang. There's going to be so many cool things coming. And um, I just want to say thank you for taking time to join us here on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jeff. I really enjoyed uh, spending the hour with you and, and certainly had some fun along the way and uh, just really appreciate what you're doing for the industry as well or educating around safety and, and all these things that make uh, GA a, a great experience for so many. So thanks for what you're doing as well. You are very, very welcome. I look forward to seeing you next week at NBAA. Um, you, you always have a, a heck of a showing out there. Yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, stop by and see us. We're in the main display area and uh, can't wait to chat with customers and, and both of our products as well as our OEM uh, aircraft partners and, and engine partners. So it's going to be a great week and uh, looking forward to being there. You got it. Have a wonderful evening. All right. You too. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Good night. And thanks to all of you for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. We're off next week for NBAA. We will bring you some content from the show with all new announcements, very cool things happening out there. And then we are back on October 29th with Delphine Tedeschi, a real Rosie the Riveter, joining us here on the show. She is 99 years young. Cannot wait uh, to uh, introduce you to her and uh, it is just going to be another wonderful show. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight, and I wish you all blue skies.